Hello to the Robart Center and colleagues and students. Uh, thank you for this invitation to deliver this lecture. Uh, I'm sitting in the office of the City as School Toronto, uh, where Dylan Alsop, who is kindly making and editing this video, is a teacher of art in the city. And we're in the Center for Social Innovation in downtown Toronto. This paper arose from an invitation I received from the Japanese Association of Canadian Studies, who asked me to prepare a paper on something about Canadian popular culture. So I started to position myself as someone on the outside looking in and saying, what would I want to know, or what would I have perhaps observed, while at the same time I have to put it out there that I actually really like everything that I mention in this paper. So um, I will have to write this up for the Journal of the Japanese Association of Canadian Studies. So if you have any comments, please feel free to email me. All comments are welcome. This paper is in four parts. The first is called Setting the Stage. The second is called Funny Not Funny. The third is called Here Not Here. And the fourth is called Haunting the Infrastructures. In the last several years, Canadian popular culture has been the subject of unprecedented success in the global entertainment industry. Several recent landmark events illustrate this trend. One was a remarkable sweep of the 2020 Primetime Emmy Awards by the Canadian comedy drama Schitt's Creek. The American television industry nominated Schitt's Creek for 15 and awarded the show seven Emmy Awards, breaking the record for the most Emmy nominations ever given to a comedy series in its final season. Oh boy. Our show at its core is about the transformational effects of love and acceptance. And that is something that we need more of now than we've ever needed before. And I just wanted to say for any of you who have not registered to vote, please do so and then go out and vote because that is the only way that we are going to have some love and acceptance out there. Please do that. I'm so sorry for making this political, but I had to. The show also became the first ever comedy or drama series to sweep all four leading categories in a single season. Schitt's Creek also won the 2021 Screen Actors Guild Award for Outstanding Performance by an Ensemble in a Comedy Series, the 2021 Golden Globe for Best Television Musical or Comedy, two Television Critics Awards, two Queer Tees, two Webbies, three Canadian Writers Guild Screenwriting Awards, and others too numerous to count. Awards is really a sub-theme of this talk. Schitt's Creek tells the fictional story of the Roses, a millionaire family from Hollywood who lose everything but their clothes and ownership of a small town that the father, Johnny Rose, purchased on a whim. The concept is based on the true story of American film actress Kim Bassinger, who purchased a small U.S. town in the 1980s. While the lead characters are modeled on very close study of reality television stars like the Kardashians. Evicted from their mansion, Appalled by the repossession of their belongings, the Rose family land in a motel in Schitt's Creek, where inevitable clashes between the family and the local community ensue. The title of the show is based on the name of that fictional town, which is named after its fictional mayor, Roland Schitt. But it's also a pun, since Schitt is a bad word for excrement, but spelled differently, so it can be spoken aloud. There is an English idiom, up the creek, without a paddle, meaning in hot water, stuck, in a jam, or sometimes up shit creek without a paddle, meaning, according to the Urban Dictionary, stuck in an awkward position with no way out. Quote, I have no savings, so if I get fired from my job, I'll be up shit creek without a paddle. The series was rejected by HBO and Showcase and produced by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in partnership with the little known American server, Pop. It was later acquired by Netflix and then by Amazon Prime. I will have more to say about the remarkable event that was Schitt's Creek. The game changer, one fan commented, suggesting that the show might change television comedy forever, as though Canadian performers hadn't done that already. First, we need to pause and change the channel. While Schitt's Creek producers, writers, and cast members were celebrating their unprecedented success at the Emmys, the singer, songwriter, and record producer, The Weeknd, was preparing his unprecedented solo performance, its solo if you discount his army of dancing robots, 
for the 2021 Super Bowl halftime show, the most watched event on U.S. television. The weekend was born in Toronto as Abel Tesfaye, the only son of Ethiopian immigrants. And in the space of little more than a decade, he went from being a high school dropout dedicated to drugs to the most commercially successful black singer in the world. Tesfaye grew up listening to Ethiopian music and spoke only his family's language as a child, but he acquired a love for American R&B performers, such as Michael Jackson, who has especially influenced his music. While MJ was always upbeat and defiantly optimistic, however, Ethiopian music has a plaintive melancholy affect. You can hear the dance between these influences in the weekend's voice and music. The Weeknd launched his music career in 2011, just 10 years before the celebrated halftime show, with a mixtape of songs posted on his website. His first listeners included fellow workers folding sheets at a local American apparel franchise in downtown Toronto, who, according to online folklore, had no idea they were listening to him. For a time, he kept himself quite hidden. Tesfaye's subsequent success has surpassed his wildest youthful dreams. The Weeknd has won three Grammy Awards, with three currently pending, six American Music Awards, 19 Billboard Music Awards, 19 ASCAP Pop Music Awards, two Guinness World Records, two MTV Video Music Awards, 15 Juno Awards, with five currently pending, five SOCAN Awards, and one Brit Award. He was awarded the Alan Strait Award by Canada's Walk of Fame. I'm so overwhelmed right now. This is out of this world. You have no idea. I gotta be honest with you, I didn't think I'd sell out the O2 Arena. I always told myself if I could be successful coming from where I came from, then I could do anything. I grew up in Scarborough. I dropped out of high school. Me and my friends, we just left home, man. We just started living the downtown life. I knew that I really wanted to be something. I just didn't know really what. Some of you might know, some of you might not know, but I hadn't left Toronto for like 21 years, man. I stayed home. First time ever on a plane was like my first tour a couple years ago. And of course, um, I want to thank the city of Toronto um, for the endless inspiration. I'm going to make sure I make you proud, hopefully. Thank you. In 2017, he was featured on the cover of Forbes magazine for earning $92 million in a single year. He bought a mansion in an L.A. gated community where his neighbors included Drake, Britney Spears and the Kardashians. He became the first artist to hold the top three positions on the Billboard Hot R&B Songs chart simultaneously. The Weeknd's Blinding Lights is the longest charting Billboard Hot 100 song of all time. Following his performance for the 2021 Super Bowl, Tesfaye purchased a $70 million mansion in the exclusive Hollywood neighborhood of Bel Air. Recently, he told reporters that his house is haunted. This is certainly true of his music. Through these events, as you may have observed, The Weeknd enacted a precise reversal of the narrative premise of the comedy drama Schitt's Creek. In that series, a globetrotting family living in an ostentatiously luxurious Hollywood mansion loses everything following the demise of their video rental business and moves to a cheap motel in a small town outside Toronto where they struggle with the dual traumas of bankruptcy and displacement. The family communicates their alien status to their new neighbors through their extravagant clothing, 
entitled attitudes, and hysterically dysfunctional family life. The town's residents counter through strategic use of their local knowledge and connections. Speak of the devil. Good morning. Ray. Hi. Hi. I, uh, I just stopped by to make an appointment to see the town council. You're looking at us. I'm Bob, it's uh, Ronnie, uh, you know Ray. Yes, yes, Ray spent a wonderful morning with Ray. Well, I can see you've got a million things on your plate, so. Both narratives, the real life rags to riches story of the immigrant son, Abel Tesfe, and the fictional riches to rags story of the globe-trotting Rose family involve dramatic multi-generational displacements that alter their lives forever. Building on journeys of displacement, alienation, and discovery, both sets of performances, the beguiling comedy of Schitt's Creek and the mesmerizing music of The Weeknd, communicate a strong feeling of precarity in tune with the times we live in. The show's future was precarious. The actor's sense of place is precarious. There are times when the character's grasp on reality is precarious. As Stephanie Patrick puts it in her study of Schitt's Creek, the Rose family exists in a precarious state, which brings with it attendant feelings of insecurity, anxiety, and placelessness. Precarity opens the door to challenges of self-invention in collaboration with diverse people and conditions. That is the lesson of the new global economy, and in some ways, it is the through line of both these sets of performances. Appropriately, both of them were catalyzed by changes in media technology. The Roses family business goes bankrupt when their DVD rental business collapses, while Test Phase music reaches its growing fan base through YouTube and social media. Also appropriately, both sets of performance draw richly on erudite knowledge of American pop culture, whose images and conventions they echo and manipulate in a language that is not nostalgic so much as simultaneously celebratory and sardonic. Through this layering of different affects, both creator performers show an acute capacity to turn their searchlights upon themselves simultaneously outside and inside the stories and worlds they inhabit. Both draw viewers into journeys that acknowledge alienation, pleasure, conflict, disappointment, and loss in different ways, rejecting the cruel optimism, to use Lauren Berlant's unforgettable phrase, that defines so much industrialized popular culture. Both allow their viewers to get in touch with something that, however much like a fable, feels real within the genre templates in which they appear. As viewers, we witness their struggles to become insiders to their own stories. As Catherine O'Hara, who plays the Rose family matriarch in Schitt's Creek, commented during a break in filming, it's like we're aliens learning how to be humans. It is when life is random, unpredictable, frightening, when one is up the creek without a paddle and finds one must change, and then finds that one can change with the help of others, it is then that hope appears. Both sets of performances have moved millions of fans to embrace them with exceptional levels of devotion and reward. Given the way these two stories echo, parallel, and reverse one another, they provide an opportunity to explore themes of place, identity, and feelings about the future being navigated in popular culture today. My comparison of these sagas that's important to point out involve distinct stories anchored in distinct genres and infrastructures in the culture entertainment industry. Schitt's Creek is a quirky, self-reflexive, socially conscious television series whose central figures are very strongly connected to one another and to Canada's comedy tradition. The Weeknd launched his own career online and for the last decade has worked with increasingly complex and expensive sound producers to produce global hit singles supported by surreal and increasingly horrifying video narratives wherein he appears as the central character. Race is clearly part of the difference in their stories, especially in conjunction with these other differences. The Weeknd is a black first generation immigrant whose path to success was supported not by cultural institutions or funds, but by social media, his own record company, and the support of other successful black performers, particularly Drake, who is popularly credited with putting The Weeknd on the map. 
Eugene and Dan Levy are, by contrast, white Jewish Canadian Americans whose comfortable role in the film and television industry is symbolized by their fictional ownership of the failed DVD company. Their actual life is not perfect either. Dan Levy has stated that his struggles with homophobia informed his writing and directing in Schitt's Creek. No one is homophobic in Schitt's Creek, though, just as no one is racist in the weekend's videos, although these experiences inhabit them as they haunt the artists who produce them. When Dan's character, David Rose, a self-declared pansexual, falls in love with and then marries his business partner, I hope that's not a spoiler, Patrick, the people of Schitt's Creek are sentimentally very happy for them. Gay protagonists are hardly novel in television comedy, but making the town's warm acceptance of gay love central to the story's conclusion marks a step forward for world television. It fuels the hope that people can overcome their prejudices against each other and against themselves and embrace one another's complicated humanity in a more equitable world. In your heart I see the start of every night and every day In your eyes I get lost, I get washed away Just as long as I'm here in your arms I can be in no better place You're simply the best Better than all the rest Better than anyone Anyone I've ever met Oh, you're the best The weekend's videos do not offer romance as a conclusion to his life struggles. They show a man who is preoccupied with, but resistant to, connection. Besieged by failed affairs, opposite directions, drugs, ghosts, bandaged faces, scenes of violence and self-incrimination that could come from a horror movie, graphically externalizing in his videos the way these scenes presumably haunt him in his present life. I have introduced some important commonalities and differences between two events that simultaneously brought Canadian popular culture into the global entertainment spotlight. So many preconditions paved the way for these achievements. Canadian writer performers have built a rich archive of creative work across its literature, film, and television cultures that favors a wry, ironic, slightly self-mocking, gender diverse sense of humor. Critical writing on this archive stresses its ambivalence and its root in colonial structures of power and opportunity that shape our popular culture. Genres and talent pools are not only created by influences and attitudes, they are also created by institutions and infrastructures. We will come back to this theme. There's little record of contact between Weekend and any Canadian cultural institutions, although I learned he performed at the Mod Club, a Toronto stage that featured an amazing range of musical performers, and that should have been deemed a cultural treasure and supported along with countless other music venues that have closed in Toronto. In this introductory tale of two journeys, then, the final theme in honour of the Mod Club is where Canadians live and who they are. Despite our lasting attachment to the beautiful natural landscapes beyond our cities, more than 80% of Canadian residents live in cities. They have immigrated from diverse continents, races, languages, cultures and religions. Half the residents of Toronto speak a language, a first language other than English. A number of television series now showcase the diversity of Canadian cities. Some are set in the past and some in the present. Some are mystery comedies and some are comedy dramas, but they try to create a thicker canvas in which characters push at the boundaries of who and what it means to live where they are. CBC has also produced series set in more peripheral locations. Anne of Green Gables, Corner Gas, Little Mosque on the Prairie, Mohawk Girls, a show about four young Mohawk women trying to figure out how to be Mohawk in the 21st century that ran from 2010 to 2017. You'll get the old, yay for you, you don't pay taxes. And then yet again, I'm gonna have to explain, it's not that simple. And then they're gonna hate me. And then I have James's family and my family who don't want us to be together. And then we're gonna break up. So I can't show up in a fur vest and leather pants. Mohawk Girls was inspired by a 2005 documentary also called Mohawk Girls, directed by Tracy Deer and produced by the National Film Board. The location of the fictional Mohawk girls recalls genealogically, as well as geographically, the conflict between the Ganesataki Mohawk and the township of Oka in Quebec, 
which wanted to expand a golf course with new condo development on unceded Mohawk land, including a burial site. The dispute erupted in 1990 when the Ganesataki Mohawk failed to obtain an injunction against the golf course expansion, despite support from Quebec's Minister of Native Affairs, who wrote a letter of support stating that, quote, these people have seen their lands disappear without having been consulted or compensated. And that, in my opinion, is unfair and unjust, especially over a golf course, unquote. Unfortunately, not all levels of government were equally supportive, including his own. The town of Oka persevered with its plan, and other Mohawk supporters arrived to defend the Ganesataki Mohawks. An alliance of land defenders blockaded the Mercier Bridge, blocking access between the island of Montreal and its South Shore suburbs. And the escalation of police activity lent support to growing acts of violence against the Mohawk people. I was living in Montreal at the time, and I will never forget the news footage of angry white people hurling stones and insults at Mohawk elders, women, and children attempting to leave the bridge, or the ominous sound of helicopters circling the south part of the city. And as we got closer, we could hear the noise of, of rocks um, bouncing off of cars. And my mother yelled for us to get down on the ground. And, and then just like that, we were in the middle of it, and our car, um, we had, we had rocks hit it, we, we couldn't see anything because it was a dust cloud in front of us. My mother started um, screaming and crying because she was so afraid. And I remember also being afraid but wanting to understand what is this, what's, what, what's happening and I... I left Montreal not long after those events. Tracy Deer directed the 2005 documentary Mohawk Girls, which was later spun off into the TV drama Mohawk Girls, and then directed and co-wrote the 2020 film Beans, which portrays the crisis through the eyes of a young Mohawk girl and is now screened on Netflix. Beans won the Canadian Screen Award for Best Motion Picture in 2021. She signed a contract with the Creative Artist Agency that year, an American sport and talent agency based in LA. In this brief background, we have seen some showcasing of the regional racial and sexual diversity of Canadian towns and cities. We have also seen the emergence of countless rewards for individual achievement, as is becoming common in neoliberal institutional contexts, including our own, laid over familiar patterns of professional advancement and dispersion. With this backstory, it is not surprising that popular culture is preoccupied by negotiating its complicated relationships to place. Some performers have chosen to be very conspicuous in this regard. Americans know as much about Canada as straight people do about gays. <laughs> Americans arrive at the border with skis in July. <laughs> and straight people think that being gay is just a phase. <laughs> a very long phase. When I'm overseas and people mistake me for an American, I'm as outraged as when I'm mistaken for straight. <laughs> No one wants to know that I'm gay. And even less people want to know that I'm Canadian. <laughs> On my resume, my agent replaced the word gay with blonde. And Canadian with outdoorsy. <laughs> so, I replaced outdoorsy with blousy, which makes me a blousy blonde. <laughs> I get all the best friend roles. <laughs> That's Scott Thompson, one of the writer-performers of Kids in the Hall, a comedy series that ran from 1989 to 1995 on the CBC and on CBS, HBO, and Comedy Central in the U.S. Their name is attributed to U.S. comedian Sid Caesar, who said that if a joke did not go over, he would attribute it to the Kids in the Hall, referring to young writers hanging around the studio. If the comedians were lucky, those kids would have been Canadian. As Shane Cubis comments, 
It's an open secret that much of U.S. comedy has been built on the backs of Canadian entertainers, unquote. Cubis mentions the baby-faced geniuses who forged Second City Television, Harold Ramis, Rick Moranis, John Candy, Catherine O'Hara, and the list goes on. CBC's Kids in the Hall, NBC's Saturday Night Live, launched by Lauren Michaels, and the comedy club franchise Yuck Yucks were all launched in the 80s by people from Toronto. Kids in the Hall created a more collective, improvisational approach to performance, emphasizing ironic treatment of American media culture, a penchant for mimicry in an unforgiving mockery of traditional gender roles. Without these instigators, there might have been no live or televised Just for Laughs, now the largest comedy festival in the world, no comically poker-faced heroes in cross-border hits like Due South, Murdoch Mysteries, Kim's Convenience, or Schitt's Creek, no Martin Short or Eugene Levy or Dan Aykroyd or Catherine O'Hara or Lily Singh or Sibo Liu, recently catapulted from his role in Kim's Convenience to hosting SNL, to starring in Shang-Chi, the first Marvel movie featuring an Asian hero or anti-hero, to presenting at the Oscars. In sum, no incalculable volume of Canadian talent developed under the umbrella of public broadcasting and exported to work in U.S. media. Anyway, congrats, man. I mean, first Asian Marvel lead, that's huge. Oh, thank you. I almost can't wrap my head around it. I mean, you get it, right? Like, first fully Asian cast member on SNL? That's amazing. Oh, yeah, thanks. I just think it's weird that people keep track of this stuff, though. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, I just got this. First Asian man to move from Canada to America named Simu. Oh, my God, I have one that says Bowen. Oh, no way. Yeah, I was just... I forget to take mine off. The ambivalence about that border crossing is so entrenched that it informed comic writing long before Schitt's Creek was conceived. The mock documentary, The Canadian Conspiracy, released in 1985, explores the premise that Canadian performers are being strategically trained by the state-run Canadian Broadcasting Corporation to be indistinguishable from their American counterparts. Innocuous looking white performers like Anne Murray, William Shatner, Dave Thomas, Martin Short are being sent to the US as a front for a planned invasion by the Canadian state. Brainwashing sessions lasted long into the night. So intense were these so-called rehearsals that today CBC alumni can only remember the network with a gratitude that borders on reverence. The, the government institution that, that made my whole career in California possible was unquestionably um, Mother CBC. You know, everyone has different pet names for the CBC. I just used to call it Papa. These performers are simultaneously iconic and indistinguishable, creating a pleasurable sense of vicarious complicity for viewers who know where they come from. Hard to say which is funnier, the idea of a military avant-garde led by these baby-faced performers or the film's exquisite mimicry of the paranoid anti-communist vocabulary of American black and white programming of the 1950s. In this film, the investigation of the conspiracy leads to betrayal by one of their own, Eugene Levy, SCTV stalwart, and years later, the reverse border crossing producer, writer, and fictional dad of Schitt's Creek. ANN cameras were rolling while this man exposed his government's plot to conquer America. This man is a Canadian. Look, I'm not saying that all Canadians are involved. This man is in fear for his life. And I'm not saying that, you know, all Canadians are, are not involved. You know, it, it depends on your point of view. Eugene Levy, alias Stan Schmengi, Bobby Bittman, Earl Cannonbear, indoctrinated at McMaster University, operated out of Second City Television, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and most recently, Schmengi Productions. Who is this guy, Gene Levy? Who are you talking about? I don't know him. The Canadian conspiracy mockumentary reaps its satire from the insight that Canada's government-supported production of talent for export to America parallels the country's government-subsidized production of raw materials like fur, lumber, and fossil fuels. The combined forces of state policy, market inequality, and transnational 
corporate power compel Canada to nurture and export its precious natural resources to the USA, whose money and infrastructure are further capitalized by manufacturing or otherwise processing this raw material into finished commodity, which, as Harold Innes points out with respect to pulp, which becomes paper, which becomes the news in Innes's time at least, which they sell back to us. It is no accident that one writer of the Canadian conspiracy, Mark Akbar, went on to write films like The Corporation and Manufacturing Consent, which are incisive studies of excessive corporate power in the contemporary world. As a way of describing something that actually exists without actually describing it, The Canadian Conspiracy is a classically ironic work. Some argue that the frequently ironic attitude of Canada's writers is rooted in its entrenched sense of political powerlessness as the product of arriving here at the behest of two colonial powers, England and France, perched on the northern border of a third, more compelling world power, the United States, and forced to negotiate a dual role as marginalized or colonized subject of larger empires while continuing to colonize and exploit indigenous lands and peoples. As a people bent on self-preservation, wrote literary critic Gerald Noonan in the 1960s, Canadians have had to forego two luxuries, that of forgetting themselves in gay abandon and that of losing their tempers in righteous wrath. Yet there is a kind of humor that combines full understanding of the contending forces with a wry recognition of one's limited effectiveness in controlling them. This is a humor based on the incongruity between the real and the ideal, in which the ideal is repeatedly thwarted by the real, but never quite annihilated. Such humor is Canadian. In this assessment, Canadian irony is a form of accommodation that neither concedes nor revolts, but creates an imaginary space of complicit, shared understanding. Part of what makes the Canadian conspiracy ironic is the idea that Canada's government might conspire against the American empire. In Jokes and Their Relations to the Unconscious, Freud suggests that jokes represent a release of the psychic energy we normally invest in maintaining certain socially essential inhibitions, unquote. The U.S. appears to be the target, but the animus underlying the humor is unmistakably directed in both directions, not only at the U.S., but at our own government. Ethically, in the context of cascading colonial conspiracies, real or imaginary, there is responsibility shown on all sides of this psychic release. Schitt's Creek offers a funny portrait of the grandiose pretensions of American ex-millionaires facing off against the modest pretensions of small town residents. But pointedly, none of its characters stay the same. The characters of Schitt's Creek trip over expectations of other people and other people catch them. In this sense, the series is not ironic. Its sentimental portrayal of reformable characters demonstrates a more hybrid nature, as we have come to expect from CBC comedy dramas. Part comedy, part local culture, part genre, could be science fiction, historical fiction, murder mystery, romance, even sitcom, and part social critique. In this respect, it resonates with Terry Eagleton's description of Jane Austen's classic feminist novels as, quote, comedy that will act as an agent of social improvement by repairing misfortune, resolving conflicts, scourging vice, and rewarding virtue. Comic art of this kind presents us with a fantasy of social harmony and is thus utopian and ideological at the same time. Schitt's Creek, like other Canadian series, takes the conventional comedy of locational misadventure a step farther than its American equivalents. It moves the order sideways in a pointed but hilarious manner to make room for the outsiders. At the beginning, the Rose family feels alarmed contempt for ordinary people living in a small town who don't know what they are missing. They start to lose that contempt by the second season. That is, of course, what happens in the nostalgic comedies and Christmas movies so popular today when uptight people leave the city and move to a small town to find their true selves. Schitt's Creek is less nostalgic. As Dan Levy said, it's a comedy, but there's a bit of weight to it. In our own way, we're taking a stand. I've been able to learn and watch as people who had originally watched our show saying, this is very funny, Catherine's accent, the clothes over the years, 
in direct alignment with what was happening in American politics. The reactions went from, this is very funny, to, I need this. These unpredictable entanglements reveal both the idealistic and the ideological contours of Canadian television culture. The point of the story for Schitt's Creek and other shows I will mention or have mentioned is that they have to try to learn to live and work together. To do that, they have to stop being racist, sexist, or classist jerks. For the record, that never does happen in some comedies. In this respect, the irony or ambivalence that allows writers to address their jokes and insults in multiple directions have a potentially positive dimension. The arrival of the outsider is arguably always disruptive. Any supplement to an established set of relations disrupts as well as enhances it, as Derrida explained. Whether that supplement or outsider is a child, an alien, a neighbor, an enemy, an immigrant, a non-human life. One can resist change in response to the outsider the way that a conventional situation comedy does with the same characters repeating the same foibles week after week without ever learning anything new. Or one can open out to the other and become changed in the process. Being aware of the needs of others, the humanity of others, the limitations those others might impose on one's freedom, the limits we might impose on theirs, none of this is a loss. We have seen the worst of manifest destiny, the last frontier. While the Canadian is, well, not so sure, but we have a lot of institutions and infrastructures for which the answer matters, and not always in the same way. A trip on a bus that I didn't know. Met a girl selling drinks at the disco. Said you come back when you let it go. Seemed complicated cause it's really so simple. Walking down Young Street on a Friday. Can't follow them, gotta do it my way. No fast lane still on. Looking at Toronto hip-hop artist Chaos skipping down the streets of downtown Toronto, recognizing the buildings he's passing in an area not yet hit by wrecking balls, I can't help but compare his bouncy affect with that of The weekend, or even the more laid-back Drake. We are in a different time now, of course, a time scalded by a pandemic and austerity budgets and gentrification and climate change and a general sense of head-down precarity. Such differences are tangible for sure, but there has never been a consistent black sound coming out of Canada or out of the Toronto music scene. Chaos shared his views on this aspect of Canadian black music in an interview published in Topia. He said, it's like the black people here, we bring our own culture. Whereas in the States, it already has a black American culture, which has been there for years. So when you come from Trinidad or somewhere else to America, you kind of assimilate into American culture. But here, there's no flavor in the Canadian culture, so we more keep our own culture. You could say, to put it in the language of this talk, they are here and not here at the same time. He adds, because Toronto, in the actual Aboriginal language, means meeting place. And I think that's what comes out of our music. Like, there's no particular sound. There's just a bunch of sounds. A bunch of sounds doesn't sound all that inviting, but he puts a beautiful spin on the music that can arise when insiders and outsiders, place and placelessness, here and not here, collide. The music is a mediation of those experiences. Musicians are making a bunch of sounds, which is a practice, a spatial practice, which encompasses and produces representational spaces when they hear or play with one another. I'm borrowing Henri Lefebvre's terminology here on the production of space. Drake and Weekend came from the same city, kind of, but their disparities of musical style are greater than their different personalities. 
being able to produce a bunch of sounds where musicians and listeners build musical vocabularies and feelings together inside the intensity of musical performance depends on having spaces in which to gather. Such spaces are less and less sustainable, even before COVID shuttered so many storefronts, as a result of gentrification and policy indifference. A music venue that holds a couple hundred ticket holders cannot compete with millions of record sales or Spotify downloads or condo developers. And as long as hosting live music outside of stadiums is a winning or losing commercial venture, the place for it is as mutable as a cloud. 22 music-friendly venues closed in Toronto in 2020, including the Mod Club, where The Weeknd jump-started his musical career in 2011 and performed again loyally wearing the same camo jacket four years later. With the way the world is turning, there is no sane or rational way that we can keep this space alive, said the owner of Club 120, a bar in Toronto's Gay Village that was forced to close to make room for a huge double tower condo development. Our industry has arguably been hit the hardest and virtually no politician has expressed this view or gone to bat for us directly. Time will tell, but it looks grim. This story recalls the dramatic transformation of Yorkville, now Toronto's most upscale shopping and condo district, that was home to popular bohemian coffee houses in the 1960s, like the Riverboat at 134 Yorkville Avenue. Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, Ian Tyson, Gordon Lightfoot, and members of the band all launched their careers there, and black performers like Odetta and Buddy Guy played there when they came to Toronto. Performers marinated Canada's singer-songwriter tradition in this scene, but many found its commercial incentives inadequate and went on to live and work in the U.S. Neil Young moved to California in 1966 to perform with the band Buffalo Springfield. Joni Mitchell moved to California in 1967 to record her first album, Song to a Seagull. Her song about Toronto's riverboat club, Night in the City, appears on that album's A-side, which has its own title, I Came to the City. Listeners probably assumed she meant L.A. Stairway, stairway, down to the crowds in the street. They go their way, looking for faces to greet. But we run on laughing with no one to meet. The riverboat scene built creative bridges between folk, rock, and pop music that helped to define the music of their generation and those that followed. The destruction of Yorkville's vibrant counterculture was rooted in the lack of a viable music industry, an unregulated thrust to develop the area, and unconcealed political hostility to the social as well as musical vibrancy of the scene. A case can be made that these musicians were visited frequently by the ghosts and dreams of that youthful community. The riverboat was rocking in the rain Midnight was the time for the rain Oh, Isabella Proud Isabella Since then, the growing presence and influence of black musicians has reshaped Toronto's music culture. If they still confront the combined challenges of an anemic recording industry and a fickle urban landscape, they also continue to combine musical genres and traditions with rich and beautiful results. Such is the case with the mix of R&B and Ethiopian elements intertwined in the music of the weekend. <laughs> When times were rough, when times were rough, I made sure I held you close to me. So call out my name.
there's a double layer of crying and contemplating that seems to work differently in weekend than with the mainstream in rap and hip hop, whose performers tend sonically and rhetorically to be unambiguous in their deliveries. He will never give the woman what she wants. He hates and celebrates his incapacity to commit. He wants what he's addicted to, but it might destroy him. He's messed up. His music is remarkable. A fan posts that he has the voice of an angel and the words of a devil. Rather than expressing vulnerability, he expresses heartlessness, suffocation, violence, loss of consciousness. He's beating himself up with self-recriminations about his willingness to succumb to things, to greed or drugs or women, causing pain to others and to himself, but not so much that he's going to give them up. His musical scenarios are more consistent than the conditions in which he's living. It seems people relate to being on that track. There is, as Stephanie Patrick wrote of Schitt's Creek, the powerful affect transmitted by expressing precarious lives. Exciting to me that this shit is like coming out so quick. It's like it never, as far as us being like, hey, we're doing this thing, it's just been like a month and a half. It's enough of the time. In addition to acknowledging difference within black music culture, we need to recognize difference in cultural infrastructures. There's just one fund allocated to popular music. If you own a record label, you can apply for a subsidy from the public private partnership factor. This is how Factor describes its mandate. Factor differs significantly from a traditional Arts Council model and should not be regarded as such. Factor is a public-private partnership administering funds from the Department of Canadian Heritage through the Canada Music Fund and from Canada's private broadcasters. Factor's mandate is to provide assistance toward the growth and development of the Canadian music industry, both domestically and internationally, with a focus on commercial success. Factor's largely unknown existence was publicized widely in 2020 when Factor awarded Grimes, Canadian partner of Elon Musk, $90,000 to record an album. This fund has helped many Canadian recording artists produce their work. I have not seen any evidence that Factor grants were sought by or awarded to Weekend's label. It must be the sleepiness which keeps Winnipeggers here. If only I can stay awake, pay attention to where I'm going, where I've been, and get out of here. Stay awake. Stay awake. Stay awake. While Canadian comedy performers were creating an accessible and familiar place for their audiences, supporting localized stories and settings, and creating a virtual space viewers could feel at home in. And while independent record labels were seeking public subsidies to record and release the music with perceived international commercial potential, the Canadian film industry was renting out landscapes and crews for movies ostensibly set in the USA. One could watch these films without any idea that they were filmed in Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, or Winnipeg. The need to disguise these cities over decades of filming led to what Ian Robinson has called an aesthetic of placelessness, through which film settings were scrubbed clean of identifying landmarks. This only began to change in the 2000s. People of different cultures have different needs of this world, but the ability to know and respect oneself in relation to the place one's in is surely amongst the most important, the most precious, and increasingly, for many people around the world, the most precarious. There are many ways that a sense of place can be stolen, some of them involving no travel at all. As I have outlined here, individual talent, government infrastructures, urban spaces, race, cultural traditions, all influence each other, and their meanings or implications are best understood three-dimensionally in this context. Cultural works such as the TV series and pop stars I have mentioned are the result of many creative negotiations across these processes. They involve not only diverse spaces, 
and diverse forms of mediation, but also diverse modes of emotional connection or structures of feeling. In Raymond Williams' felicitous phrase, that creators negotiate as they generate and transmit their own ways of feeling. We might join these places because we share those feelings. We might share those feelings because we join those places. But then again, we might not. In his conclusion to a literary history of Canada, published in 1965, Northrop Frye observes famously that the Canadian sensibility is less perplexed by the question, who am I, than by some such riddle as, where is here? Here isn't just a function of myth, however much its perceived absence inspired Fry's interesting question, just as cultural transmission is not just a function of ideas. Culture is constituted by multiple and contradictory processes that are pervaded by questions of power, class, inclusion, ethics, belonging, and insecurity. We are still asking questions about place, not because we can lose the hold of the global over us, but because it is ethically and environmentally crucial that we take some responsibility for where we are, as we have learned from our most important teachers. The struggles of indigenous people to protect land and water have taught us not only a great deal about place, but also a great deal about infrastructures. Anne Spice, author of an article entitled Fighting Invasive Infrastructures, Indigenous Relations Against the Pipelines, asks another rhetorical question. Does the word infrastructure denote an apparatus of domination? In a recent article for the Canadian Journal of Communication entitled Infrastructure and the Form of Politics, Darren Barney answers, sometimes. Exploring what he calls the potential of infrastructure as a form of politics beyond words, Barney acknowledges that when the term is used by industrialists, developers, financiers, and their representatives in the settler colonial state, it means just what Spice says it means, the materials, worlds, and subjects of capitalist extraction, disposition, and exploitation. But when the term is used by other people, it can point to something else, to what Barney describes, citing Spice once again, as an opening in which other possibilities can assert themselves. We do not choose whether to participate in the infrastructures that organize our musical pleasures, our Netflix binges, or the ways we teach and learn. But we can choose which parts of those infrastructures we might wish to dismantle or change and which parts we might wish to defend. For instance, here's an infrastructure question. Why shouldn't a young artist, a 15-year-old son of an underemployed immigrant single mother, black kid living on the outskirts of an urban center, for example, have access to a fully equipped, fully funded sound system or recording studio? Why does our Ministry of Culture, that strange amalgam of modernism and neoliberalism, exempt so many artists from the purview of its mechanisms of support? Why is the distribution of music commodities so controlled by foreign entities? Given all this, it is not surprising that the weekend's videos are suffused with images of horror taken straight from David Cronenberg's movies of the 1980s. Humor was not the only cultural export Canada was producing at the time. The bodies of Cronenberg's heroes in this period are all horrifyingly invaded or engulfed by external forces and objects. The Weeknd likes to show just that kind of horror, but coming from the inside. Abel Tesfaye, the guy who berates himself for being heartless, donated a million dollars to the UN food program for relief aid in Ethiopia. Half a million to the Music Cares COVID-19 relief fund half a million to frontline health workers at Scarborough Health Network, 200,000 each to Black Lives Matter and the Colin Kaepernick Know Your Rights Camp Legal Defense Initiative, 300,000 to Global Aid for Lebanon, and 100,000 to National Bailout, according to a 2021 report. He doesn't think people should starve. It's wonderful for people who earn millions of dollars to commit themselves to eliminating famine, sickness, and war around the world. This used to be the job of our governments. Infrastructures are shaped by relations of political and economic power and domination, but they are not entirely determined by these relations. As I reflect on this term, I hear the voices whose call for build back better after COVID identified sustainable infrastructure reform as the foundation for equitable public policy. The same concept can be applied to our systems of cultural production 
which would be better if they lost their compliance with hierarchies of value, along with the viral obsession with competitive prizes and awards, emphasizing individual achievements that permeates all our endeavors. For thinking through these ideas, Schitt's Creek and The Weekend have been excellent and inspiring companions.